I'm Elliot Forrest. Joining me now is the Tony-winning actor who is currently uh, seen off-Broadway in the play Eisenhower, This Piece of Ground. He created the role of Pippin on Broadway and so many others. You know him, you love him. Ladies and gentlemen, John Rubenstein, great to see you. Thank you. Good to see you, too. I loved the play. We saw each other afterwards. Uh, you were uh, terrific. Before we get into this, it's so Great to have you as part of QXR. Uh, both you and your family have been a, a part of it for a long time. And I remember uh, you actually hosted radio concerts uh, from Carnegie Hall at one point, right? You remember that? Yeah, for six years I did a, a show called AT&T Presents Carnegie Hall Tonight. And that was great. I loved it. I got to go to Carnegie Hall and they would record concerts, but then the show was only an hour long. So they would break a concert mostly into two pieces. And, you know, the big symphony would be on one part and the smaller pieces on the other part. And I would interview the, uh, the artists, the, you know, the soloists, the conductors, and sometimes the composers if they were still alive. And that was, um, that was so great just personally, selfishly for me to get to meet all those people and talk to them about music and about their lives. And then I think we, we gave the listeners um, a lot of extra information that they don't always get. Well, you and your family, including your father, the great pianist Arthur Rubinstein, have been a part of uh, classical radio for uh, a very long time. We play your father's recordings all the time. I, I just want to talk to you a little bit about um, about your dad. Uh, your sister Ava has called me over the years. In the old days, the, I would be in the studio and the actual phone would ring and people, including your sister, had the phone number right to the studio. And that was the first time I talked to her. And um, my favorite moment with her was uh, directly from your family being able to say, uh, sometimes I see it as Arthur, sometimes I th see it as Artur. What did he prefer? And her answer was he preferred whatever was appropriate for that country, that he liked Arthur here and Arthur. Is that your understanding as well? He had a, an impresario. We would, we would call him a manager or an agent. But in those days, he was an impresario who handled, you know, big sort of, you know, classical music and opera people. And um, Saul Hurok was his name. Yeah, he was well known in those days. And he, he was Russian, and he picked up my father wherever he discovered him. I'm not quite sure how that first, you know, uh, uh, combination took place. But he thought that Arthur Rubinstein sounded, I think in his words, like a, a tailor from Chicago, you know, and wouldn't command people's attention. Uh, so he took the H out and made it be Artur, which it is in Polish, which my father was, is Polish. So um, Artur Rubinstein is how he, he, his name is written in Poland, but not in this country. But he thought Artur Rubinstein would look exotic, foreign. Oh, a, a distinguished European artist is visiting us, not some guy from Chicago, you know. Do you have um, a memory, or maybe the fondest memory, of seeing him on stage, whether it's Carnegie or at home, uh, of him playing the piano? There were so many. I, I heard him play in the house every day, uh, you know, when I was just doing whatever I was doing. He was practicing or he was playing, he was getting ready. And so I heard his music again and again. I would hear him play the hard parts, you know, over and over and over and over and over, trying to get them better, try to not make any mistakes. And then I would go to his concerts again and again in Europe, all over the world, in, in this country, in New York, uh, everywhere. And then as I grew up, he died when I was 35 years old. So I had that many years of hearing him play all the time. Um, and uh, so to pick one would be impossible, no. but. There were certain moments, I mean, I do remember, he gave once at Carnegie Hall in the early 60s, he gave 10 recitals in, in sort of a short period of a couple of three weeks, I think. <clears throat> All different. He never repeated the same piece twice. It was 10 completely different recitals. And, and I went, of course, to all of those. 
and a couple of times I took I took uh, my very first girlfriend to one of them. That was very special. It had nothing to do with him, but uh, but it was it, uh, I had a great time that night. And uh, I even took my math teacher in eleventh grade. I guess I was in eleventh grade, uh, and and he was a music a music fan. So he was he was so happy to be there, and that made me happy. But I do remember there was one time in Poland. It was in 1958. First time my both parents had been back to Poland since the war. My mother was a Catholic, so she could have stayed there and been perfectly fine, but not my dad. And they and most of his family, virtually all of it, they were gone by the time the war was over. He had been in America, so uh, you know he had gotten away from that. Um, and he played the Carnival of Schumann, which was a, a piece that he played very often and played beautifully. And I had heard it many, 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 many times growing up, and even before that, quite recently, that same year. And I had never really liked it very much. I don't know why. It's very episodic. It's it, it, for some reason my younger brain didn't enjoy it as much as I enjoyed most of the other things he played. And there was one night in Krakow where he played it yet again at a recital, and it got me. I don't know if he was especially inspired that night, or I just sort of woke up out of my stupor. Um, but that night I said, wow, I love that piece. That's so beautiful and brilliant and, and eclectic. It moves around in so many, and it tells so many different stories. So after that, over many years, I heard him play it many, many, many more times. And I always loved it and looked forward to it. But that night was a big change. So, I mean, those are a couple of times. There were many others. Uh, we have many recordings, uh, not only of your dad playing, but uh, being interviewed. And I'm just curious if uh, what role uh, classical radio played in your life growing up? Were, were you guys listeners? Did uh, he listen to himself uh, in addition to being you know, a guest on many of our shows over the years? I just don't remember him listening to the radio. He certainly played on concerts that were broadcast, but he never listened to his own stuff. He would listen to his recordings when they first came out, you know, on a proof. And he would listen very carefully to them to approve them or not. But not after that. He didn't listen to them a lot. So, no, but I personally have always been an avid listener uh, to the radio, both as a child and then now, you know, I'm a Californian. I drive cars. I'm always listening to classical music, but I always listen to QXR when I'm in New York. I was listening to it last night, as a matter of fact. So, uh, yes, we love classical music radio. I would be a sad person without it. You are on stage playing Dwight D. Eisenhower for almost two hours. Uh, what was the development of, of this play? How did it come to you? Well, um, it's sort of a long story. I'll try to shorten it. Peter Ellenstein, who is a director, who has directed mostly in California, but in places all around the country. And um, he, while working in Kansas there, had happened upon a speech of Dwight Eisenhower's, the, the famous one called the Cross of Iron speech, where he talks about, you know, all the, the militarism that is possible in a country like this that has money and that has won, in quotes, two world wars in a row. And uh, there is this danger of making military sales of equipment and armaments, as well as a military frame of mind where the solution to problems is always to just bomb the hell out of people. And then that'll sort of take care of everything. It doesn't matter who dies, as long as it's not Americans, you know, other people dying, not such a, not so important. This is the military-industrial complex speech, right? But this was the speech where he said that situation, that mindset, becomes humanity hanging from a cross of iron. And Peter Ellenstein read that speech, didn't know much about Eisenhower, as mo most of us, even those of us who lived through his, 
his two presidencies uh, don't know. And he said, geez, this, this guy deserves some more attention and respect and time. What was it that most interested you uh, about this uh, about this president? And so I'm around young people a lot. And I, I have a line in the play where Eisenhower, who became president of Columbia University before being president of the, of the country, uh, said, I had time to think about the future those young people were preparing for. And that's what I feel. I see the world now, because I'm old, um, through my children's and my grandchildren's and my students' eyes. And our country and the world, you could even argue, we're in a pretty awful period of our history. And that's due to a lot of things. Don't get me started. But it's been a long time since we have heard a very, very powerful person. Don't forget Eisenhower ran the European uh, theater of war in World War II, and he pretty much, with his you know, leadership, defeated Hitler and changed the world. Then he was president of Columbia University, which was a huge responsibility. Then he was the first leader of NATO. He put all those European countries together in a peace, peaceful attempt to prevent wars instead of just wage them. And then he was president of the United States for eight years. And with all of that power, it's, it's hard to find anybody else who has had that much power, if that word is appropriate, and who remained so humble and so open-heartedly caring about the people he was responsible for. That's what hooked me into wanting to portray, as written in this play, but the play doesn't create any, any fiction. Everything I say in the play, basically, is what Eisenhower either said in a speech or wrote in a, in a memo or was quoted as saying uh, by, by a book writer or an interviewer. So none of it is, is fiction, none of it is made up by the playwright in order to whatever, sound relevant or make a political point that, they, that he wants to make. It's all Eisenhower. And I feel that the young people in this country, as well as us older people, need to hear this kind of approach to leadership and power and influence because we just don't hear it anymore. It's become something quite different out of the mouths and from the actions of our political leaders. Do I understand you actually met Eisenhower at some point? I did when I was, I think, nine or ten years old. My father, as you said, was a pianist, and he played every year in Washington, D.C. <clears throat> and he had a dear friend there who knew Sherman Adams, who was uh, Eisenhower's chief of staff. Um, and Sherman Adams took my father and mother and my sister and me, uh, we were young children, through the White House, gave us a tour, sort of a private tour. It was very uh, exciting. And then at one point he stopped at a room where Eisenhower was talking to a rather large group of people. And he sort of waved at Ike across the room from the doorway. And Eisenhower said, excuse me, and he stepped down and, you know, wended his way through the crowd of people he, was, he had been talking to. Came over to the door, was happy to meet my dad. I think they'd met before. I had actual pictures of them together. Um, and so they talked a bit, and my mother, of course, and then he bent down and he shook my hand. Hey, well, nice to meet you, sonny boy. You know, he was just very, very friendly and open, and that was it. That was my meeting with Eisenhower. So we didn't discuss a lot of politics. Um, the new play is Eisenhower, This Piece of Ground. It stars the only actor in the show, John Rubenstein. Thank you so much for your time.